Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, here in downtown Columbus. This is the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. It is a day in which we celebrate the Reformation. We're glad that you have joined us for this service of morning prayer and Holy Communion. We hope that all is well with you, and we want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We are glad that you're here. Today, I am joined in worship leadership by Mr. Mark Williams, our Director of Christian Education, Mr. Kevin Jones, our Minister of Music. I'm Tim Ahrens, the Senior Minister, and we are pleased to be together. I would remind you, since this is a service of Holy Communion, to have the elements of communion ready. And we will also return later to receive an offering today. So we are grateful for all of your support of the church. And let us be prepared now for worship. We worship in the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit. Send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me. And bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. O oh God, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. join us in the psalm of the day, Psalm 90. O oh God, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the, Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and the earth were born, from age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O oh child of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. Return, O oh God. How long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy, Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So, so shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. Make us glad by the measure of the days that you have afflicted us and the years in which we suffered adversity. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. May the graciousness of our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Prosper our handiwork. In my welcome, I forgot to invite you to look at the service and follow along with us. Found at the website of the church, www.first-church.org. As well, you can find it in the links that we have sent out to members. Now, since you're with us, may the peace of our Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. Can, can, can you hear me now? No. 
Can, can, can you hear me now? No? Wait a minute. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I bet you heard that one, didn't you? I know, Mr. Mark's being silly. But here's the point that I want to make today. And that is that God whispers in our ears sometimes, I love you. And sometimes God will say, I love you. We can hear it nice, nice and, and well. And then there are times when God turns up the volume to remind us that God loves us. Isn't that amazing? God loves us. And through all the scriptures in the Bible, from Moses all the way through, we're constantly being reminded that God loves us. And you'll notice that we're wearing our red mask and I've got my red shirt on because today is Reformation Sunday. And red in the church is kind of like a celebration because we're going to cel we celebrate Reformation because we no longer have to go through somebody else to get to God. That the rules changed, that we broke those things down, and God comes directly to us. We have learned that, and so we celebrate that. So today, the one thing I want you to remember is God loves you. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead, as far as Don, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negeb, and the plain. That is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. And the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank Thanks be to God. God.
Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in the 22nd chapter, the 34th verse. Listen for the word of God. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Not from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We have two amazing passages of scripture today. First, in Deuteronomy, we hear about the final moments of Moses' life. Uh, a life that has been uh, long-lived at 120 years, uh, a life that has been marked by tremendous leadership, um, as I like to say, the greatest leader that the scriptures have ever seen, leading his people out of slavery and all the way to the edge of freedom. And in this story, we find out that Moses cannot cross over with the people into the promised land, but dies on the edge of promise. So he makes it all the way, but not quite over. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus does what I call boiling down all of the laws from 613 to 2. You know, there are 613 laws of Moses, 
As a matter of fact, that were written down. We think of Ten Commandments, but the fact is the laws in Leviticus and, and Exodus and Deuteronomy continue to just roll out. 613 in all, trying to establish a people and a law code and a system uh, of life that will guide the people for all time, right? But when Jesus is pressed on this, he simply says it comes down to two things. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So in a sense, the great lawgiver gives us his final words, and the greatest reformer of the law in Jesus gives us the synthesis of what it really means to follow God's law, right? So you have the lawgiver and you have the law reformer in the same passages looking at each other today in Deuteronomy and Matthew. This is very important, I think, on Reformation Sunday because uh, you can't have reform without law. Right? You can't have something change until you have an establishment of something. And uh, we believe in our tradition that we are what we call reformed, and that's the Protestant definition of who we are in our tradition, and reforming. So we're constantly reforming what we see. We're constantly trying to understand something with new eyes, with a new lens, and, uh, and to make it real, and uh, to make it graspable, to make it um, uh, present for people in the day in which we're living. And I think that's the power of Reformation. Whenever you have someone who can take something and make it come to life, something that's old, something that is uh, maybe treasured a little too much, almost to the extent of idolatry, that we get so wrapped up in this having to be this way, and they can say, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we should look at this another way. One of the things that's been happening, if you haven't been paying attention all summer long, in the gospel and now into the fall, Jesus is having all of these conversations, this back and forth with the Pharisees. He's telling parables. And when he comes to this one, he's once again put on the spot. They're trying to nail him. They're trying to say, you think you're so smart. Well, we're going to catch you. We're going to trip you up. Uh, and the fact of the matter is he nails his first answer. He gets a 10. If this was the Olympics, he'd get a 10. He nails it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. No questions about that. But he comes up with this second um, law that is like unto it. And uh, it's the first time that these two laws have been coupled in this same way. That it's not only about loving God, loving the God within, loving the God outside of ourselves, but it's about loving your neighbor and loving yourself. I mean, that sort of gets lost in this. Um, the old story of, you know, if, you, if you're on an airplane, you put the oxygen mask on yourself in, in a crisis and then on your children and then on the people next to you, right? If you can't take care of yourself, if you can't love yourself in a healthy way, then you certainly can't give anything to anyone else. You've, you've got nothing to give. Uh, I can't be a friend to my neighbor if I can't be kind to myself. So Jesus is really trying to help us see what matters. And then in classic Jesus form, he turns the questions back to the Pharisees. You want to know what matters the most, he says? Well, I'm going to ask you a question. So what about this Messiah? Who is the Messiah? Who, and, and who is his father? Well, Jesus knows the answer. <laughs> and it's not David. <laughs> so Jesus knows who his father is. He knows who his eternal parent is, right? But like has been happening, if you haven't been following, you've got to follow. Every one of our passages ends the same in recent weeks. He tells them the truth. He reveals the truth, and they are silenced. They're silenced. There's something about the truth, when we hear it, when we feel it, when we know it, that quiets us, that shuts us down. 
The clamor um, turns in and the commotion of the moment turn into calm when we hear the truth. And this happens a lot to us. Um, sometimes we hear it from our children. Sometimes we hear someone who we really hold in high esteem speak the truth. I had that experience this week. I was reading through uh, Howard Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Um, it's one of my favorite books, written in 1949 by one of the great mystical um, writers of the 20th century, Christian pastor, uh, chaplain at, uh, at Brown Chapel in um, Boston University, professor at, and, 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 uh, and pastor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he talks in there about something that's really profound. He says that when you hate, we're talking about the love of God and love of neighbor. He says, when you hate, something happens to you. Something dries up in your spirit. Something dries up in your soul. When what you spew is venom, when what you do is hurt others, the creative spark the genius that God has placed in each of us dries up, it disappears. And we have no reservoir of goodness and creativity and brilliance to draw on. It's a very interesting, interesting thought. And on this Reformation Sunday, I just want us to hold to that thought. When we carry anger, when we carry hatred, um, Something is really destroyed in us when we carry um, something against our brother or our sister, our neighbor. Something happens to us. We lose our ability to be creative. We lose our ability to see possibilities. And I think on this Reformation Sunday, maybe the greatest reform that we can experience today is to reform our own spirits, um, to allow the creative spark, the genius, the goodness of God to come to life in us in a new way. And to, um, to lift up those who have guided us in these times and through the centuries to find what is good, what is possible, what is um, what is genius, if you will? What, is, what, is, what will change things because we've opened ourselves up to the goodness of another and the goodness of God? My thoughts for Reformation Sunday, and again, we celebrate these two amazing gifts to us. Um, my sermon title talks about um, the Pope because he has set forth a beautiful new vision uh, for a post-COVID-19 world, and you're going to be really happy with what I do next, both my colleagues and all of you watching. I'm not going to tell you what he says. I'm going to tell you to go look at what he says and read what he says, because we have a new reformer in our midst, my friends. Somebody who hasn't given in to hate, he hasn't given in to hopelessness, he hasn't given in to disdain for any human being. And as a result, he is opening the doors of creativity and goodness, the doors to God. So I invite you to read his encyclical, um, which talks about the fellowship of all and the love that can happen on this planet that can change the world that we're in into a whole new world. Amen. you join me in prayer. God be with you. And also with you. That there may be purpose and fulfillment of God in all that we do. That we may show others this day the love that you have taught us. Christ have mercy. That 
the church throughout the world may respond to your call for peace and justice. Christ have mercy. That those who are in need be helped and comforted. Christ have mercy. I would like to pause this day to lift up in silence um, the special needs and concerns of each of your hearts in each of your homes and for this congregation, the members, the family, the friends who are today listed in Depart to Serve and whom we hold in our hearts in prayer. And again, I invite you to pray silently or to lift those names where you are. Jared and Anita coil as they welcome their newborn into this world. For Pauline Fritz and her continued recovery. For all who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. For all who are battling cancer or COVID-19. For all who are struggling with other illnesses conditions, those who are facing unemployment and hardship, we lift them all to you. That we may be strengthened by your grace for the task of this day, Christ have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about. For the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we gather um, at the time of offering to receive gifts for the Mid-Ohio Food Collective. And you may note the name change. The Mid-Ohio Food Bank is what we knew for many years. They have, they have strengthened their organization by this change of name, quite frankly. They are dedicated to feeding those in our community who are hungry, and actually those who come in need of hope as well. They need food, they need hope, they bring fresh produce as well as canned goods and other food items to families in need. And the numbers are growing. That is not a good thing. We have a growing number of those who have desperate need for food and food security in their lives and for their families today. So we have been partners with the Mid-Ohio Food Collective for generations. I invite you today to be generous as we step into these days of winter and the late fall to remember our sisters and brothers, the children in our community who are hungry today. Let's be generous and give to the Ohio, the Mid-Ohio Food Collective. Thank you.
It's hard to believe that this could create division. You just take a look. There's a simplicity and a splendor as we talk about with Holy Communion. Bread and cup. Division? How could the body of Christ be divided over this? That's a really good question. There was a meeting by two of the great early reformers, Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, German and Swiss. They met in a castle named Marburg. They came together believing that the Lutherans and the reform, the Swiss reform, could somehow find some common ground. They came with 33 principles they held about the Reformation in the early days of the Reformation. They agreed that day, after a long conference, that they were in compliance with one another on 32 out of 33 things. The one thing they couldn't agree on was Holy Communion. What is the meaning of Holy Communion? And the story goes that Martin Luther pulled his knife from its sheath and drove it into the communion table and says, this is it. I am done here. So, when you see this table and you think back to Marburg Castle, you have to also envision a knife <laughs> in the middle of the table. It's taken us 500 years almost to come to some sort of consensus and understanding and love for one another around this table. This simple feast that Jesus has given us is to remember him. It's not about us. We sort of lost track of that somewhere along the way. It's about him. He called his disciples to the table first and said at the end of the Passover that night, this, this is my body. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to this table, your table of grace, the table of our Savior's presence and his love in our lives, help us to come together to no longer be divided, but find ways to rejoice in his presence in our lives. We pray as we gather this day that your love abounds in each of our hearts, in each of our lives, and here at his table. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This bread broken is the body of Christ. This cup of blessing is the blood of Christ. May the Spirit of God be upon these gifts and on all of us as we come to his table of grace. Take and eat. Take and drink.
Let us join together in the post-communion prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. <clears throat> Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. In preparing to depart, we as a faith community have heard the word and are called to respond and serve. There are many ways to serve our neighbors in this faith community during this time of pandemic. <clears throat> Watch your email, church website, and Facebook for updates concerning our faith community and how we will organize to help those in need during this time. Just a reminder, all worship will be online until further notice. No in-person worship. Please note all the virtual studies and meetings being offered this week. Also note the upcoming Bread House meetings, the 25 days of prayer, the film Rigged, and the webinar on homelessness and housing. Faith formation continues each week online with exciting opportunities for learning and growing in our faith. The pre-K through fifth grade Wednesday Connections is in the form of a video posted on Facebook each Wednesday for families to view at their convenience. Youth Connections is on Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m. And our formative discussion for adults will be held throughout the week. Also, Reverend Dr. Tim Ahrens is leading a midweek, mid-morning, and Monday evening class on the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Complete details of the dates and times for this study are listed in the Depart to Serve leaflet. If you need to be in touch with Reverend Ahrens or Reverend Corzine for emergency pastoral care or name a prayer request, please call 614-733-4547. This number is listed in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Just a reminder that your giving can be done through PayPal, Easy Tithe, or simply writing a check and sending it in the mail. No matter how you are giving, be sure to mark it for the mission of the week or to the regular church budget. If you have not done so, please like us on Facebook uh, for First Church. There will be numerous postings through this time for engagement, activities, and devotion. So please monitor your email, the church website, and Facebook page. We invite you to the virtual coffee hour after the service today. You may find the link in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Just click on the link and it will take you to the coffee hour. Let us sing the closing hymn as we depart with a heart to serve. Thanks be to God. South African Bantu language. He says, a person is a person through other persons. This is translated one way, or I am because we are. I am because we are. All of us need each other. We need each other to live, to thrive, and to enter this week with hopeful hearts. So this week, know that I am and you are because we are. Go and love, go and serve God, and thanks be to God.